beginning of the Aboriginal People's Television Network is a very exciting time in our development as First Nations people of Canada. Tonight, happy birthday to us. APTN turns 23. We as a First Nation uh, community within the province of Quebec and, and Canada, um, you know, uh, basically left out of that whole, that, that, that whole opportunity. Listigouche First Nation wants in on the booming cannabis industry. The gangs, community safety, the violence in the community, um, trapping issues, um, the, the need to support the trappers, um, being out on the land with their families, uh, the language, um, the housing issues, um, so that, that continues to be a huge issue. And Lac La Ronge First Nation meets to discuss their top concerns. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. This summer marks the worst year on record for Chinook salmon numbers in the Yukon. But it's nothing new for First Nations in the territory who have been struggling with low salmon numbers for years. Our reporter Sarah Connor shows us how one First Nation is tackling the problem. Many decades ago, fish camps could be spotted all along the Takini River. But for most First Nations people in the Yukon, fish camps are a memory of the past. All of our fish camps are empty. There's been nobody. Um, fishing for a number of years. He jumped right there. Brandy Mays is a lands operation manager for Kwanlin Dunn First Nation. Kwanlin Dunn is one of many First Nations in the Yukon working to protect and monitor Chinook salmon. A highly valued traditional food, Chinook stocks have been in decline for around a decade. Now, in place of fish camps, there's a new fixture along the river sonar equipment. It's looking at a new way to connect with salmon and what do the salmon need from us? You know, they've, they've given their lives to us for thousands of years and now it's our turn to like help the salmon. Just across the river, land steward Cheyenne Bradley is using sonar software to count Chinook as they travel upstream to their spawning grounds. All right, so here's a salmon. Uh, this long line that I was talking about, this is the shadow that it casts. So far, an right estimated here, 456 fish it made it past so the Dakini this sonar like this summer, over 200 more well. than last year. Um, but that number hour, is a far cry from 1,800 that. fish counted in 2018. For downstream is we can count because they need 400 and something here at the sonar, but at the end of the day, all that matters is if they made it up to their spawning grounds to spawn. Sonar information is vital. It can help the DFO and First Nations make decisions about salmon conservation, like asking their citizens not to fish. I know it's a really, really hard thing to ask, but I mean, it's in dire times right now and we kind of really need to, need to let the salmon go and spawn, so. If people aren't worried, there should be. James well, McDonald is the chair of the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee. He says this is the worst year on record for Chinook. As of August 24th, just over 12,000 Chinook passed a sonar near the Canadian and Alaskan border, down from 31,000 fish counted last year. You know, that's a, a biological tipping point, which means we're close to losing our salmon, uh, much closer than ever before. McDonald says it's not clear why numbers continue to decline, though things like climate change, bycatch and competition for food may be to blame. I would imagine a combination of all these different factors that have taken place over the last, uh, last decade or so. While fish camps no longer dot the Dakini River, May says it's important First Nations stay hopeful that they may one day return. I know some people are, you know, it's, they're not, they're losing hope. And it's a small, a small number of salmon that are coming back, but we have, we have hope. We're optimistic. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Community safety was the top concern of members and leaders at a recent political forum. That's according to the chief of the Lac La Ronge Indian Band. It took place during last week's Woodland Cree gathering in La Ronge. 
APTN's Leanne Sanders was there. It was the first time since before the pandemic that a cultural gathering could be held in La Ronge. Indigenous artisans and craftspeople with goods for sale and demonstrations of traditional methods of bow and paddle making, hide prep and birch bark biting and beating were showcased at the urban reserve across from the lake. Chief Tammy Cook Searson says during political meetings, talks centered on the challenges of making the community safer. The gangs, community safety, the violence in the community, um, trapping issues, um, the, the need to support the trappers, um, w being out on the land with their families, uh, the language, um, the housing issues. Um, so that, that continues to be a huge issue within our communities. The Saskatchewan government's trespass legislation enacted at the beginning of the year is at odds with the treaty right to hunt and fish. And Cook Searson says when it comes to traditional territories, First Nations need to continue asserting their rights. I think that's important for us to assert our rights to and, and to say this is what we want instead of people telling us what they think we should do like provincial governments, federal governments, we as First Nations need to continue to set guidelines, um, set rules and regulations of our own. But Cook Searson says it's also important to focus on the positive things happening. We need to build on those successes, you know, even the youth hunting craft camps that we have, the land-based learning, um, all the different successes that are happening in our communities, the graduate graduation rates, the post-secondary rates that are going up, and people getting out there um, earning degrees degrees, uh, trades, uh, going into the Army, the RCMP forces. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. To Ottawa now, where the federal government has approved a new vaccine to fight the Omicron variant of COVID-19. Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos made the announcement Thursday afternoon. The vaccine is manufactured by Moderna and approved as a booster dose for individuals 18 years of age and older. The government says it triggers a strong immune response to Omicron's BA1 variant and is also effective against the BA4 and BA5 subvariants. Duclos says a total of 10.5 million doses of the new vaccine will be delivered to provinces and territories by the end of September. And he stressed the importance of all Canadians updating their immunizations as we head into the fall months. Canada has been ahead of all other G7 countries and most other countries in the world in terms of two-dose vaccination. 90% of all adults in Canada have received two doses, but only 60% of adult Canadians have received a third dose, putting us behind all other G7 countries except for the United States. Time to step aside for a quick break. Coming up, the uh, Quebec First Nation sees the gold in the green. Cannabis rush is like the next gold rush, right? So we're proud to see it all unfold.
Welcome back. The cannabis rush is in full swing in Mi'kmaq First Nation on the Quebec-New Brunswick border. Weed shops and the band council are figuring out what the future of cannabis looks like in Listigouche. Amelia Fournier has more. Cannabis rush is like the next gold rush, right? So we're proud to see it all unfold. Cannabis shops popped up across Listigouche First Nation shortly after marijuana was legalized. Outside of First Nations, Quebec regulates the distribution of cannabis. So they've, in essence, created a monopoly for their own government uh, through, through their regime. Um, we as a First Nation uh, community within the province of Quebec and, and Canada, um, you know, uh, basically left out of that whole, that, that, that whole opportunity. So Listigish residents made their own opportunity. The ban council created its own regulatory framework. There's a search warrant that's being executed. But in January 2020, provincial Quebec officers and local police raided pot shops in Listigish due to a lack of official licenses. Store owners like Alexander Morrison lost thousands of dollars in merchandise and faced trafficking and possession charges. Since the police raid, uh, pretty much the community, well, a portion of the community pushed back against that. And uh, the next day we were granted temporary permits and ever since then the cops haven't been bothering us. Morrison, I mean, who is also a band counselor, said Smoke Shop 69 sells around 300 ounces of weed a day. You know, eventually one of our goals is to get our own 69 brand across First Nation communities all across Canada. And he's building the shop's own brand with his son Joey. There's what, 14, 15 shops, like all the jobs that it's bringing, all the outside money that it's bringing into the community, you know. We're putting food on the table for families, you know. Everyone's eating off of this, off of our uh, business. So it's, you know, it's great for the community. It's everyone involved, you know, not just our business, but every other dispensary in the community as well. The chief says he wants the economic bounty of the cannabis industry to create better services for the whole community. He says a more formal system is needed for the industry to give back. You know, one of our, our oldest teachings is that you have to give back. So your first catch, you're supposed to give away. Uh, if you're hunting, your first you know, your first catch, you're supposed to give part of that meat away. So, um, you know, when it comes to business, that, that principle to me should still apply. Morrison said he doesn't have a problem giving back voluntarily, but he's worried having one sole distributor and more regulations could inhibit their competitiveness with nearby First Nations. They're talking about maybe having the band be a distributor for some products. I mean, if it's some products, we're okay with that, but we don't want to be limited to one supplier. That just does not make sense at all. Ultimately, both Gray and the Morrisons want to see a safe cannabis supply in the community. We're all for having regulations that make sense. You know, we don't want to kill our, uh, our the gains that we've made. We managed to uh, <clears throat> we managed to make a, to, and create a you know a nice cannabis economy here in Listigouche. Amelia Fournier, APTN National News, Listigouche First Nation, Quebec. Last night, Listigouche Council passed a motion imposing a six-month moratorium on new weed regulations and community engagement on the subject. So any plans for a council-owned distribution center have now been put on hold. To U.S. politics now, and a Yupik woman made history in a tight race in Alaska. Mary Peltola is the first Alaskan native to sit in the U.S. Congress. She edged out former Republican Governor Sarah Palin in a special election to finish a term left vacant by the death of Representative Don Young. Coming in with 51.5% of the vote versus 48.5%, her campaign message was fish, freedom and family. Peltola is the executive director of the Kuskokwin River Intertribal Fish Commission and served 10 years in the state legislature. Big news. A documentary by the Kenora Chiefs Advisory highlights some of the programs they have for youth while giving them a chance to deal with the intergenerational trauma of the past. Our Daryl Stranger has the details in this encore presentation. The Journey Home is a documentary that touches on past harm First Nations people and communities have faced while exploring programs and services offered today to help ensure the survival of the Anishinaabe Way. The Kenora Chiefs Advisory hopes the film will also help youth to heal from the intergenerational trauma. 
we work with them through the you know the trauma they've experienced in their life, guide them to you know setting themselves goals of where they want to go, for people to know, and giving them like I say opportunities just to have fun. You know, there's so much sorrow in our First Nation communities. We we all know that, and you know, um, a lot crisis after crisis after crisis ha happens in our community. You know. Um, you have to need to have some fun. The short film highlights a youth and family wellness camp that is accessible by all the communities that purchased it in 2021. We have the Rolling Hills. We have, you know, our own sacred teaching sites where we intend to have bigger events for our kids. We have areas identified for our elders, areas identified for specific teachings with our, you know, whether it be, you know, the traditional ceremonies, um, everything from top to bottom. And that space is true healing. Started in 1995, the Kenora Chiefs Advisory is an alliance of nine independent First Nations within the Western region of Ontario. An Elders Council, Youth Council, and the communities collaborate on initiatives. Their mandate is to provide programs and services to First Nations in the field of health, education, and social services. We need, these, we need people to know that we are here. We are not going anywhere. We know what we're doing, and we know how to participate, focus, and take care of our most valuable resource, which is our children. Build them up, make them strong. We know what works, what hasn't worked, and sit back and listen. Sit back and take notes. Sit back and learn from what we no, is best to A horse-based therapy do. program, land-based healing, kids. and a variety of sports are just a few examples of the we programs offered. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, we Winnipeg. We really need to look at ourselves. Time now for one more quick break. Coming up, a photo of unmarked graves in Kamloops wins an international prize. It was incredibly powerful when you were driving up to really be confronted by a uh, cross after cross after cross.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And this one was sent in by Susan Hare. Susan included the caption, this is how M. Chigging First Nation says goodnight. Beautiful picture and we send well wishes to you, Susan, and your community. You can send your photos by email to share at aptn.ca and do include all the details you can about your picture. Now let's take a look at Friday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 25 for Halifax, sunny and 22 in Fredericton. Showers in 13 for Kujuak, rain in Nain and a high of 14. Sun's out in 25 for Montreal, 23 in Shibugamu. 28 in Sault Ste. Marie, 27 for North Bay. 29 with showers in Thunder Bay, rain and 21 in Sioux Lookout. 21 with rain in God's Lake, 13 with showers in Norway House. 21 in Winnipeg, 24 in Dauphin. Sunny and 24 in Regina, sunny and 26 in Saskatoon. 24 in Meadow Lake, sunny and 21 in La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, 32 for Peace River and Grand Prairie. 31 and sunny in Edmonton, sunny and 34 in Lethbridge. 25 with the sun out in Victoria, 36 in Kamloops. 28 in Prince George, 24 in Smithers. 17 in Old Crow, showers and 15 for Whitehorse. 19 with rain in Yellowknife, 21 in Norman Wells. 11 with showers in Saks Harbor, 17 in rain in Polituck. 13 for Arviette, Whale Cove and Baker Lake. 5 in Resolute, cloudy and plus 2 in Arctic Bay. World Press Photo Exhibit has returned after a two-year hiatus. The best of the best in photojournalism is back on in Montreal, and this year's winning photo was taken at the site of the former Kamloops Residential School. Freelance photographer Amber Bracken took this photo for the New York Times in June 2021, shortly after the discovery of unmarked graves in Kamloops. The World Press Photo Jury called it haunting, arresting, and symbolic. The Alberta-based photographer documents Indigenous resistance and the ongoing effects of intergenerational trauma through her work. It was incredibly powerful when you were driving up to really be confronted by uh, cross after cross after cross after cross. I think it underlined just how many children didn't come home. When you are gifted a, a rainbow and all of the elements are just there you, do, you don't turn your back on it right so this felt like it came the closest to telling the story that i experienced when i visited the community and congrats to amber a young indigenous scientist from the opasquiac first nation in northern manitoba made good use of his time during the pandemic ctv reporter mason de Patti has this report um, that's most commonly known as elephant toothpaste. Hydrogen peroxide, yeast, dish soap, and a variety of containers cover the table. A typical day for the Monteith family. I like being curious and finding out new things. Simon Monteith, also known as Simon the Scientist, is sharing his passion for science through online videos. Whoa, it's crazy. Simon got his start during the pandemic, first making a video explaining how coronavirus spreads. Um, so I, when I was just seven years old at the start of the pandemic, I had an idea of what COVID was. This is the coronavirus and the, these are the people. About two years later, the nine-year-old has created about 60 educational videos covering topics like the human body and the water cycle. Simon's mom, Jacqueline Monteith, <laughs> says Simon has always been able to break down complicated ideas into easier to understand concepts. And I think that's what prompted this all is that it's within Simon to reach out in a way that's original, that uh, is understandable for all audiences. Simon has big plans for his channel, hoping to inspire others to follow their passions like he is. I want to um, make Simon Scientist big enough that everybody can see it, even indigenous people f farther north, so they can be inspired and do what 
they want to do in the STEM field. Originally from a Pasquiac Cree Nation, Simon is now a semi-finalist in the Canada-wide Pow Wow Pitch, a contest made to help Indigenous entrepreneurs. If I win the $25,000 that I get from winning the Pow Wow Pitch, I would um, use it to create a youth support fund so that like other people's ideas I can help support them with. A dream to help others with theirs. Mason Dipetti, CTV News, Winnipeg. Right on, Simon. That is absolutely awesome. NASA's revolutionary James Webb Telescope has captured the first ever direct image of Expo Planet. The telescope took four images of the planet, all of them in different bands of infrared light. The newly photographed planet is a gas giant, about 6 to 12 times the mass of Jupiter, and located 385 light years away from Earth. NASA says the planet is between 15 to 20 million years old, making it a young planet compared to Earth. Well, it's APTN's birthday today. Uh, I'll lead everybody out. The beginning of the Aboriginal People's Television Network is a very exciting time in our development as First Nations people of Canada. APTN is proud to continue. That's APTN Elder Jules Lavely officially uh, launching our network during a sunrise ceremony in 1999. Lavalley served as our elder until his passing in June 2021. Throughout the almost quarter century, we've brought you the stories of Indigenous peoples across the country, covering all the news others won't. Looking forward to the future ahead. Crazy, feels like we just celebrated the 20th. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday, September 1st. Can't believe it's already September. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward, thanks for being with us. Have a great night.